afternoon, everyone. <laughs> Welcome to Live at Lunch. Um, Noelle made it. Yay! <laughs> I mean, she's been here all around, all yeah. along. <laughs> uh, my name's Alex Weaver, and I'm a learning program developer here at the museum. Um, and before we begin, I'd like to acknowledge that this Live at Lunch, every Live at Lunch um, presentation is taking place on the traditional lands of the Lekwungen people, known today as the Esquimalt and Songhees nations. And we thank them for their stewardship of these beautiful lands. Um, Live at Lunch, for those of you who haven't been to one before, is a free noon hour lecture series. We have varying topics. I'm very excited about this one. Um, and it usually occurs on the third Wednesday of every month from 12 to 1 in this room. We are recording today's presentation, so it will be available on our YouTube channel. So if you're wanting to take notes, just sit back and relax and you can go and visit the YouTube recording afterwards. Um, today, I am very excited to uh, introduce Noelle Phillips, who does not have any relation to the Phillips Brewing Company <laughs> that has been asked over and over again. So, <laughs> um, and she's gonna share some tales from the forgotten pre-corporate foundations of the BC Craft Brewing. Noelle is an English instructor at Douglas College and a regular contributor to The Growler, BC's craft brewing, craft beer magazine, and the BC Ale Trail. And in the back, actually, we have the Greater Victoria Ale Trail map. So when you leave today, pick up one of these. There will not be any sampling of beer today, unfortunately. Yeah, Noelle did ask if she could bring some, but yeah, unfortunately we can't. It's an all ages event but I'm sure you'll be able to give us some suggestions. <laughs> uh, Noelle has a new book, which is gonna come out in the fall of 2024, and it's a history of craft beer in Vancouver from the 19th century immigrant brewers to modern day breweries. So I also wanna mention that today we have a very tight timeline. Um, we have someone coming in at one for another a workshop. So um, Noelle's going to give her presentation. We'll have about 10 minutes for some Q&As afterwards. Then I'm going to have to ask everyone to leave the, this room. And Noelle has kindly offered to hang around um, outside and in the Clifford Carl Hall to answer any other questions that you might have. All right. So without further ado, Noelle Phillips. Thank you. I'm glad I made it. It was a close, close call. Um, so first of all, I, I would like to acknowledge the scholars and historians whose work has been very helpful to me in this project. Uh, particular value is the work of Bill Wilson and the late Greg Evans, um, but others as well. So um, this talk today is about the early history of beer brewing in two of BC's largest cities, Vancouver and Victoria. And I'm quite interested in how these breweries represent a prototype of what sort of craft brewing is now independent, locally owned, serving the local community. Uh, in the early 20th century, corporate consolidation gradually began eating up the independent breweries of southwestern BC. And by the time provincial prohibition was lifted in 1921, the beer corporations essentially controlled the industry and independent brewing wouldn't be seen again until uh, 1982. But what was this, again, craft beer industry like in Vancouver and Victoria before those beer corporations? That's what I'll be sketching out today, trying to cover a lot of material in a relatively short time. And can I just click? Is it just the? Yeah, yeah. yeah uh, just tell me where to. Yeah, actually. Yeah. I'm just a little bit late. Okay. Just that? Just a little okay. Later. Okay, perfect. Yeah. Thank you. So let's start back in the 1850s. Before local breweries started up, the new settlement of Victoria had its share of saloons, as would the shanty town of Vancouver in the next decade, beginning with Gassy Jack's famous Globe Saloon. And supplying these saloons was beer imported from mostly England and Germany, although imports from the US were starting to compete for tap space. And you do see many ads like this one for uh, Sierra Nevada Lager from a uh, brewery in San Francisco. The idea of brewing beer right there in the city rather than importing it was gaining traction. And the first brewers in BC opened up in the 50s and 60s, 1850s and 60s. But the dominating feature of the alcohol industry at the time, which was the saloons, was a double-edged sword for this new BC uh, beer industry. So on the one hand, the saloons were a major source of income because they were where breweries could sell their beer. But on the other hand, they were developing an increasingly bad reputation. They were being lambasted by advocates of the temperance movement and not without reason. 
a historian Douglas Hamilton describes a typical BC uh, saloon ambiance. He says, one needed no direction to find the local bar. The smell of spilled beer and tobacco smoke wafted onto the street along with boisterous voices. Refuse and filth littered the area while drunken derelicts pawed at passersby. A gaggle of children would cluster around the unsteady, teasing them in the streets and robbing them in the alleyways. Fights were frequent and hotel visitors comp complained of noise, which usually did not uh, let up until the festivities ended at 8 a.m. So the very early saloons were community hubs, but as the century progressed, they became more and more places of drink and debauchery. So some were still that friendly community meeting place, but disorder was certainly growing in these spaces. Um, in Vancouver, by the 1880s, there was a drastic decrease in liquor license applications for saloons compared to those of hotel licenses, meaning, to me at least, that people seem to want, be wanting a respectable place to drink and to purchase their beer. So when breweries started up, they wanted to present themselves as respectable and civilized, and legislation reinforced their distinction from saloons. Under provincial licensing, breweries were generally granted wholesale licenses and not retail. So places where drinkers would sit down and have a drink would be a hotel or a saloon. These required a retail license, and that was way more expensive. It was about twice as much. Beers, or breweries rather, were never designed to actually be drinking places at first. Not officially, although many of them broke those laws or skirted them. So brewery owners' desire for respectability and reputation at this time is important because it's really connected to important features of the brewing industry that I think we should acknowledge. Even now, brewing, including craft brewing, is an industry heavily dominated by white men. And I'm not the only person to have discussed this. But this fact has its roots in the early establishment of the industry. So when BC joined Federation in 1871, out of, out of its 36,000 residents, about 70% were Indigenous, 24% were from various European countries, 4% were Asian. Federal legislation that was designed to kind of control the consumption and sale of alcohol was passed later in the century in the 80s and 90s, and restrictions on those uh, legislate, pieces of legislation were often imposed on Indigenous and Asian people. This ended up excluding them from what was becoming a very profitable industry. And it, it basically ensured that these very ethnically diverse cities would increasingly be controlled and financed by the white populations. So it's something to acknowledge, I think. Um, and these racist policies were the dark side of this movement for respectability in the alcohol industry. The less insidious side was the efforts breweries were making to appear family friendly and supportive of a healthy lifestyle. Um, and this is something I'll show in a few of the ads. As well as offering a nostalgia for home because many people drinking in Vancouver and Victoria were from um, Europe, of course. People from England wanted English ales, people from Germany, you know, would long for lagers. So breweries became this place for, um, that would make immigrants feel more at home in their new city. And from the beginning, breweries were trying to cultivate this warm, friendly, family-oriented reputation for themselves. They would not be seen as the new saloons. Sorry it's so small, but here's a, the first half of our brewery timeline. Uh, the first stage of Victoria beer making was basically the 1860s, and this when we get our first five big breweries starting up. These are Victoria Brewery, Colonial, Phoenix, Lion, and Bavaria. There is a James Bay Brewery there, you'll see, which opened in 1863 under Alfred Welch, who had run a brewery in England, and he was very excited that first year, judging from his ads, but by 1866, he was, it was up for auction, and then uh, the building, I believe, was actually torn down shortly after that. So we have these major, five, five major breweries. So the first one, many of you have probably heard of, Victoria Brewery, opened by William Steinberger, a German immigrant in 1858, on the shores of Swan Lake, probably, Greg Evans, <laughs> kind of speculated it might have been Elk Lake, but in either case it was a lake, and it was outside the city centre. He apparently even grew his own malt and hops, it was extremely local, um, but poor water quality forced him to relocate within a year, and he set up his new Victoria Brewery near the corner of Discovery and Government, which is actually pretty much where Phillips Brewery is now. And that's what you see on the right there. He did sell in uh, 1860, but it thrived under the ownership of several different men over the next few decades, and I do want to acknowledge there's a new Victoria Brewery opening up, and I believe he's just entered the room right now. <laughs> um, a new Victoria Brewery opening up that's sort of honoring that legacy. Uh, so Charles Gowen, uh, there's two Charles Gowens in this history. They're, it's, it gets confusing. One Charles Gowen, 
uh, purchased a brewery in 1862, and he attempted to start a malting program there. It wasn't successful. The next owners uh, in 1870, Joseph Lowen and Ludwig Erb, also tried to malt, but apparently, again, was not successful. This failure meant that Victoria breweries would continue to have to import malt from often San Francisco. Um, but there were various attempts that were generally short-lived. So the early ads from Victoria Brewery emphasized their family-friendly, community-minded nature. We start to see this uh, in other ads from breweries that followed. Um, often the first hint would be that families were supplied. So, you know, these were not saloons. You could go to a respectable shop around town, you know, the bank and stuff, the grocery store, and place an order for beer that would be delivered to your house. Um, so fact, focus on families ended up being this common refrain. Again, they wanted to remind people they were not like saloons. The second brewery was Colonial. This is 1859, opened by Arthur Bunster on Johnson Street, which it seems like it was about around the corner of the Johnson Street Bridge. Uh, and I'm, you can kind of see it's facing towards it there. I could, it was, I could not find any photos of it. Uh, it's often referred to just as Bunster's Brewery. Like Joseph Lowen, like many of these early brewers, Bunster was a businessman, so he hired expert brewers to partner with him. One of them that brewed for Colonial was James Gibson, who actually ended up being a very important brewing pioneer in New Westminster a few years later. So Colonial was very popular for the next decade until actually it burned down, he had to rebuild it. Um, but in 1867, Arthur Bunster wrote to the government and he claimed Colonial was the biggest producer of beer on the island. I'm not sure whether that was actually accurate. Uh, but that's what he said. He also said the breweries needed to be allowed to export beer since the population was too small to support them. I'm also not sure about that given the number of saloons <laughs> or still business. Um, but this is, he was trying to drum up more business for himself. It seems that Colonial was sort of cutting corners legally a little bit. In 1860, both Colonial and Victoria Brewery were charged with illegally operating a tap room, which probably meant that they were selling beer at the brewery and kind of treating it, you know, a bit like the saloons probably on the down low though, but they were caught. Uh, Colonial did travel on the edge of the law in other ways. Bunster's son, Nicholas, for example, was charged at least twice for theft against Colonial's own employees and affiliates. Not, not great. So um, our third brewery that opened is 1861, the Lion Brewery. And this is actually the, the, the grounds, the J George A. Elementary School backgrounds is where we think one of its locations was. There were several locations. Um, I'm still not sure what there was, actually might have been two different businesses. I find Lion actually very difficult to, uh, to kind of parse out. The initial location was around Queens and Chambers Street or Queens and Cedar Hill Road, which is up on the right there. And the other breweries in the little, are those little orange dots. This was called the Lion Tap in the mid 1860s. It may have actually been turned into a saloon. Uh, again, I'm still trying to find that information. There was definitely a Lion Saloon there in 1911. Another location apparently was the Retreat Saloon on Yates Street. There was a newspaper mentioned that was behind the Retreat Saloon. So I have more digging to do, but there's multiple owners and multiple locations, Lion Depot, Lion Brewery Office, the Lion Brewery Tap, the Saloon. Um, so records drop off quite a lot in the early 1990s. So uh, I'm still, still hunting them down. Our third one is 1863 Bavaria Brewery, which is opened by um, Martin Goetz, and it was on Fort between Blanchard and Quadra. It specialized in lager, which is unlike many other Victoria breweries who focused on ale at the time. And finally, Phoenix Brewery, Yates and Blanchard. This eventually merged with Victoria Brewery. It was opened in 1868 by Charles Gowen, who I believe was actually a different one from the other guy. And unlike many Victoria breweries who changed hands and partnerships multiple times, this, this one just stayed in Gowen's hands and, and run by him and his sons for the entire time until they merged with Victoria in 1893. So it was very much a family-oriented kind of business. So 12 years, we have five breweries and uh, up and running in Victoria. And then we get the 1870s and there's a national economic depression. Everything slows down. No new breweries open at this time. Uh, and instead, we get kind of a, a real downturn in the economy. But by the 1880s, the CPR was being built. Vancouver was getting incorporated as a city. The economy was picking up. Vancouver is now starting to offer competition to Victoria for beer. Uh, Victoria's population increased 184% in the 1880s. But Vancouver's would soon outpace it. And in fact, by the 1890s and 1900s, 
it's hard to see here, but basically this is from Greg Evans' thesis, Victoria's beer population stays, population production, <laughs> stays fairly static, um, and Vancouver's is less at first, and then boom, it gets really, it, it, it kind of explodes. So we start to see this pattern happening. So after the dip in the 1870s, a uh, second round of breweries starts opening up in Victoria in the 1880s, several of which would have connections with the burgeoning Vancouver industry. So in 1883, we have the confusingly named Vancouver Brewery opening in Victoria, <laughs> run by brothers Thomas and Robert Carter in partnership with George Raywood, who actually ran a North Arm Brewery in Vancouver a few years later. So this brewery was at the corner of Herald and Government. It's actually just a block from where the Herald Street Brew Works is now. This one was praised for its medals and diplomas, and it actually won a gold in the Paris exhibition, its beer. Uh, and it won at several other major beer competitions. They were very uh, experimental. They were very unconventional. For example, they used uh, pine casks, and they really bragged about this, whereas Colonial and Bavaria Brewery were like, we never use pine, like that's crappy. But they're like, no, no, we love pine. And apparently it was sort of looked down on, but they did really well. They won these, uh, won the many awards. So uh, there's also the Pacific Brewery in 1884. Also in 1884, we have the Tiger Brewery, which turned into City Brewery. Now, Tiger Brewery was o owned for one year by John Williams, who would, oops, who would end up owning Red Cross Brewery in Vancouver, which I'll talk about in just a minute. So Tiger became City Brewery in 1886, and then basically it, it lasts another eight years and it closes in the 1890s. 1885, we have, this is, okay, we have Empire Brewery opening. Uh, this is run by Henning Peters, who had owned Lion Brewery for a little bit. Uh, Greg Evans says that Empire Brewery was one of the most uh, modern facilities of its time. It may have been the first brewery on the island to have been designed from, for day one for lager production. And in the many ads he posted in newspapers in the first few years, Peters is really boasting of the technological um, advances of his brewery. Um, sorry, I'm just going to jump forward there. Uh, some of his ads, he, he had so, so, so many ads. <laughs> so unlike many other earlier breweries which were located in what used to be barns or houses, repurposed facilities, Empire and Victoria Brewery's new building uh, were, both locate, were both basically built specifically for brewing. So there was enough uh, sort of uh, profit now in the industry for people to be able to do this. So this is a new thing. And the, the uh, popular new building method was this tower style. So this is a new Victoria brewery, six stories. Um, this was a really popular new modern style of brewery. One more late one, it's 1889, and Henry Farrell opened his Ian N. Brewery in Esquimalt, quite near where Spinnaker's is now. It became known just as Farrell's. It was owned and run by Henry and his sons. He did sell it in 1894 to uh, sort of another brewer businessman pair, O'Brien and Verrillman. They renamed it Excelsior. And basically, everyone wanted to get on board with Excelsior. Two major Vancouver brewers signed up to be partners. John Leahy of Colonial signed up to be a partner. But it only lasted about a year. And so something went wrong um, and Excelsior had to, everything kind of fell apart quite quickly. In the same year in that everything was getting started, everyone was signing up, they got into legal trouble for using bottles from Victoria Phoenix and putting labels, their labels over top. Uh, and also Farrell had done that himself and also was sued the previous year for doing the same thing. It seems that they were struggling financially but it also seems they were enough of a presence in the industry to pose a threat. And this is really interesting. Victoria Phoenix Brewery says they had to lower their wholesale beer cost by 25% because of Excelsior. They say that specifically in their reports. Um, so Excelsior was, some, was posing some kind of uh, market competition, but that lowering of Victoria Phoenix's cost kicked them out of the market, essentially. Uh, Farrell bought it back in 1897. They kind of went bust, and it kind of struggles along under the name Anglo-Canadian Brewery until Silver Spring comes along. So the old guard of Victoria Breweries, all the, the ones that started it out, what happened with them? Uh, Victoria Brewery maintained its reputation and actually ate, built that big six-story facility in 1892 for $120,000, which is a huge amount <laughs> back then. Colonial, however, was becoming run down by 1888. The newspapers 
describe it sort of sadly. They said the premises are complete in every respect and when in full running order must have done a trade of magnitude, the kiln and malt house given up to the, uh, whoops, given up to the rats whose smoke begrimed walls musty with the decay of years tells its own tale of former greatness. It was still making beer, it had only three employees though, its production had dropped from 10,000 barrels a year to 600 and Colonial closed by 1897. Lion, again, we don't really know what happened to it. We know that apparently prohibitionists torched it at one point, and it was rented during prohibition to the Victoria Gospel Hall and used as a Sunday school with a bar in the room. And there's interviews of this guy who recalls the bar being in the room and going to Sunday school there. Bavaria also closed in 1894, although it seemed to be doing well in the 1880s. 11,000 barrels a year in 1888 seems pretty good, but it might have been a red flag that it only had two employees at that time. There's a couple of unusual stories that hint that stuff's a bit weird. <laughs> One crime report from 1887 said that Bavaria's owner, Charles Zoell, was charged with assaulting an S.R. Goetz by smashing him on the head with a malt board and cutting his head all up, uh, apparently because the Goetz had a knife on him. Now, Goetz is the last name of the guy that initially opened Bavaria Brewery. And I still haven't been able to track down who S.R. Goetz is, but I'm curious if this is some kind of ownership conflict that went really bad. Uh, there's also a weird story of a bear for sale. In 1890, an indigenous man sold a bear to a white man, this is what the papers say, who in turn brought the bear to Bavaria Brewery to sell it. Now this seems like a tale more akin to saloon culture where there are stories of animals in the saloon or taxidermied animals in the saloon than to brewery culture. So it feels like Bavaria is on going down some sort of different path at this point. And of course, the two favorite old guard breweries in the city were Victoria and Phoenix, who together produced over half of the city's beer output. And in 1893, they merged to form Victoria Phoenix Brewing Company, which itself acquired hotels and saloons that would sell its beer. And this merger was an important step towards beer conglomerations, essentially like starting to take over the industry. In the 1920s, Victoria Phoenix was consolidated with other breweries by the larger entity Coast Breweries, which then partnered with General Breweries out of San Francisco, which brewed Lucky Lager, which meant that Victoria Brewery was now brewing Lucky Lager up here. But by 1958, they were bought out by Labatt, and Labatt was eventually acquired by Anheuser-Busch InBev, Budweiser in 2008. That brings us to Vancouver. What was happening in Vancouver? Well, in Vancouver, alcohol was big business. 19 saloons were in operation when it incorporated in 1886, and its brewing industry started up as Victoria's was experiencing its, its revival, essentially. So the first, um, we have a little map of Vancouver breweries here. The first three breweries in Vancouver, in order, were City Brewery, Vancouver Brewery, and Mainland Brewery. And then the fourth was Red Cross, which is actually City Brewery 2.0. Um, so City Brewery was opened in 1887 in this wealthy area of Hastings, west of Burrard, and uh, by a guy named Jean Recab. We don't really know much about him. It would only be owned by him before about a year before John Williams purchased it in 1888. Next, the big boy was Vancouver Brewery, uh, whose original building sat on what is now Main Street Brewing. So that's the original building, um, and on the same property, of course, is Main Street Brewing now. And this was opened in 1888 by German immigrant Charles During, one of the wealthiest men in Vancouver, eventually. During had lived in Victoria for a decade. He ran the King's Head Beer Hall in Johnson. But once During got to Vancouver, he owned a series of saloons and hotels, like the famous uh, Fag and, Fag, pardon me, Stag, Stag and Pheasant. Um, he was a big hunter. And soon decided he's like, he, want, he wants to make his own beer, supplying his own hotel and saloons with beer. Uh, just as Victoria Phoenix would do. So with this goal in mind, he basically br um, built Vancouver Brewery on the banks of Brewery Creek. It could produce 17,000 barrels a year at the start, and During ended up helping several other brewers in the city um, start up. So around this time that During was establishing his brewery, German immigrant Robert Reister closed down his brewery in New West and opened Mainland Brewing at 10th and Columbia, not far from where 33 acres is now. So September 88, Vancouver had three new breweries, but only one would last, and that would be Vancouver Brewery. Mainland would close. Robert Reister wanted to go to Nelson. Uh, he didn't really do a whole lot in the city, and then city would be purchased by John Williams within a year and renamed 
Um, oh, that's sorry, that's the map of Brewery Creek there. I missed that slide. There he is. There's uh, Durings employees early on. Red Cross Brewery. So, John Williams, after he bought Red Cross, bought City Brewery in 1888, renovated it, upgraded it, slightly relocated it, renamed it Red Cross, and apparently he linked the medical Red Cross to how nutritious beer is. <laughs> So he says that the Red Cross stands on the battlefield for help in Vancouver. It stands for pure beer, unadulterated with any abominations, foreign abominations, injurious to health. So, um, and this is one of Vancouver breweries. So I have some of my slides, uh, I ended up having to mix them up a bit. So by 1889, Williams had taken over City Brewery. During was fully uh, integrating himself into the city to establish his business and his reputation there. Uh, he became known as one of the best loved men in the city. He donated to things. He became an alderman in 1890. Uh, one of his gifts did not go over very well. And this was a black bear that he donated to the chairman of the parks board who was starting to uh, start a zoological garden in Stanley Park. They did not have a place to keep it. So they just chained it and left the ranger's wife to supervise it. Um, and basically kept on breaking the newspapers. Like it keeps breaking out of its chains. <laughs> and everyone's getting worried. Um, the Parks Board complains to During. That's During, by the way, on the right there. They complain to him, and he's very offended, and they decide to euthanize the bear rather than build a $200 enclosure for it. Very, very sad. So he actually sort of disentangles himself from other pursuits after this point. He stops, um, he starts to focus rather on making his brewery really successful. Because he wasn't a brewer himself, he brought on a proper European brewer in 1892, whose name was Otto Marstrand, a trained brewmaster. Uh, and he came, he came there from Denmark, and Vancouver Brewery was renamed During and Marstrand Brewery, which DNM. To celebrate the brewery's renaming, they threw this big party for 200 guests. There was all this free food and free beer. They did a big core beer lineup announcement. They did tours. And During's main competitor, John Williams of Red Cross, was there. Um, they uh, actually seem to be quite friendly despite being in competition with one another. Local papers would slyly pit the breweries against one another, sometimes praising one or the other, but it was clear that they were really both boosting the economy of the city, and many of the papers highlighted that. And really by 1894, During was picking up on this, he stopped advertising his beers being made from Bavarian hops, and he started advertising them using BC hops. So he's turning like, he's becoming like hashtag drink local really, really early. It's a really interesting turn in his advertising strategy. So as these two breweries developed their frenemy ship, <laughs> and as the temperance movement grew more powerful, they really shifted their advertising to shine the best light on, uh, on their business. Many ads targeted non-traditional drinkers and emphasized the health benefits of alcoholic and non-alcoholic beer. Um, it talks about their, their ale as being very nutritious, especially adapted for the use of ladies, children, or elderly people. Um, uh, another ad describes it as being suitable for weaker people. DNM advertised their porter as being particularly suited to convalescent ladies, <laughs> and their export beer especially adapted for ladies. And uh, they also had these ads for their Alexandra Lager, which you can see are kind of focusing on women and mothers, right? Um, uh, making them feel like they are also one of the beer drinking communities. So beer is no longer a drink of debauchery. It's, it's a healthy drink. It's a family drink. Uh, Red Cross was also doing the same thing, by the way. They would market stuff. They would say things like Red Cross Porter for invalids. And they made various jokes about so-and-so's wife going down for some Red Cross beer. So this friendly competition was becoming less competitive and more friendly as the years went on. Uh, as early as 1893, the breweries actually tried to institute a price fixing arrangement, which didn't last. They both tried to raise their prices together through a joint advertising campaign. They had to drop it again, uh, but it was a hint at what was to come, which is amalgamation. And this is also around the time that they both, During and Williams, both wanted to get, get in on Excelsior, again, didn't work but you could see they were kind of working together. The actual amalgamation occurred in 1902 or 1900, depending on who you're talking to, um, and they became one brewery. They became Vancouver Breweries, and here you can see Charles During's uh, president, John Williams, secretary treasurer, and images of their two breweries there. This was a common strategy that competing breweries at the time used, which Greg Evans explains. They would merge with competition to present this united front 
in order to survive in a, an increasingly crowded marketplace. So the big public announcement of this amalgamation came in the form of a contest posted to all the major newspapers. And th there's another one of their ads. So this contest offered a $50 prize to the person who proposed the best name for Vancouver Brewery's new flagship beer. $50 would be in a lot of money. They described this beer as pure and healthy and harmless as the rippling waters of a mountain brook with a delicate and satisfying flavor. Uh, they received over 2,000 entries to this contest and some really crappy ones too, like Acme. Like a terrible name, terrible name. Um, the one that won, the winning entry was Cascade. Um, this became one of Vancouver's most best loved beers for decades. Uh, it, they, people described its healthful qualities, how it's uh, suited to delicate ladies. <laughs> and eventually its most common uh, motto was the beer without a peer. Um, so Vancouver breweries through Cascade in many ways became one of Vancouver's sort of uh, most important and best loved breweries. Another fairly long running and popular and notorious brewery in Vancouver opened just one year after Vancouver Brewery, and that was Columbia, which is on Powell Street, very close to where Parallel 49 is now. It was the most eastward of the breweries and operated on the borders of the city and of the law. So in August 1889, just after it opened, a man named Walter McDonald appeared in court with bloody bandages on his head to testify against Joseph Kapler and Fred Miller, who were representing Columbia. He explained he'd been drinking a 25 cent glass of beer at Columbia on a Sunday when the event in question occurred. This is a problem. They were serving beer on a Sunday. They were serving beer in the brewery. They'd already broken two laws. So Columbia was already in trouble before this happened. So apparently McDonald said that after an afternoon of drinking, Columbia employee Fred brought a rifle out to show the customers. Everyone's worried and they take it away from him and he loses his temper and they, quote, he fetched a large shank bone of a quadruped which he used to beat McDonald, his customer, across the head right there in the brewery. So Columbia had only been open a few months, but the judge listening to this already had opinions, which he voiced. He said, this brewery has already gained a reputation in this way, and many disgraceful scenes have been caused by the fact that liquor was sold to Indians and others on several occasions. Again, those racist laws were in full force. So Columbia was always in legal trouble. Part of the reason for its reputation, besides some of these things, uh, is that it was near Tar Flat, which was technically a resident, residential area, but very impoverished, quite a lot of homelessness and quite a lot of crime. So there's a lot of very, uh, there's a lot of robberies, there's murders, attempted murders being recorded on or near Columbia's property, which is not a great way to shine up your brewery's reputation. They didn't try to placate the authorities though. <laughs> Columbia was charged numerous times for serving alcohol legally, it disregarded other rules. In one case, uh, a newspaper reported that one of the breweries in the east end of the city, that would be Columbia, billed City Hall $2 for the expense of transporting one load of drunks home. <laughs> and the hint in the newspaper is that the load of drunks are city councillors of some kind, or like some kind of, yeah. So, um, so Columbia was also a good place to stop at when you're going in or out of town though. And it was owned by a very well-loved and cheery German immigrant, Joseph Kapler. Uh, who had immigrated to BC when he was 28. He actually worked for During in his brewery for about a year before starting Columbia. And he was diligent about getting his brewery well known. He got his maltster's license and was one of the few breweries to be able to malt and sell his, his malt. So malt barley and sell it to other breweries. He also made styles like Kulmbacher Dark Lager. These are unusual for BC at the time. And he was known around the city for German yodeling and good cheer. <laughs> So the cheeriness sometimes didn't help him. There's one really sad incident where one of his employees threatened to take his own life and Kapler essentially dismisses it while encouraging the employee to keep drinking with him. The employee was an alcoholic and there were tragic results that evening. He also didn't really have a handle on business management. He was stabbed by his kind of co-owner of the brewery when they disagreed on where a water tub should go. He almost died. Uh, the brewery co-owners, Mary and Andrew Mueller, you can see my little story on Mary Mueller in this issue, the, this spring's issue of The Growler, were quite unpredictable. <laughs> Mary repeatedly sold beer illegally, was often in court for it. At one point in the brewery, her husband like hit a guy with a sickle because he was hassling his wife. Uh, on another occasion, Mary used a horse whip to severely beat a man named Dutch Bill in the brewery. She'd been waiting for him and she'd heard that he'd said some stuff about her and Kapler held the guy down and she beat the crap out of him. Mm -hmm. 
Um, in 1902, Andrew was charged for refusing to pay poll taxes for himself and all the brewery employees. So there's a lot of stuff happening, but they also seem to be good people. Mary and Andrew had a, apparently seem to have a lovely relationship. There's various stories about them. Um, and also Mary once saved the driver of North Arm Brewery's wagon who was getting dragged when the horse spooked and took off with the, with the wagon. She somehow stopped it and saved him. So Kepler died of a heart condition and it seems that Mary's husband Andrew likely died. I can't, don't have time to get into it. There's no actual death mention of his death, but she becomes named as the brewery's owner about night from about 1907 till his closure. So, uh, and as far as I can tell, she's the second woman to run a brewery in BC. And I think the first one was Elvina Peters, who was the wife of Henning Peters of Empire Brewery. And she took over um, Empire when Henning died. So Mary, apparently when she started running the brewery on her own, we're told she had a capable directing mind and ran a business of seven staff. But unfortunately, a combination of weather and poor city infrastructure meant that she had to eventually close the brewery's doors by 1912 and never opened again. Um, but just over a century later, um, Shaftbury Brewing and then Parallel 49 would appear just a couple blocks from Columbia's location. Um, and this is, yeah, this is sort of a couple years before it closed. Uh, the fourth and final player in major, uh, in early Vancouver Brewing was Stanley Park Brewing. Nope, this has nothing to do with the currently Stanley Park Brewing, which is a brand owned by Turning Point Brewing, which is owned by Labatt, which is owned by Budweiser. <laughs> so Stanley Park Brewing now is never independent, but this Stanley Park Brewing that opened in 1896 was. Uh, it was owned by Frank Foubert, who arrived in Vancouver from Ontario. He worked all sorts of jobs until he found a niche in Vancouver, which was ale in a lager city. Vancouver was all about lager. He says, I'm going to make the best ale. He finds a building on the edge of, on, across the lagoon from Stanley Park, buys it for $2,000. It was owned by a former uh, sort of big wig in Vancouver, but he buys it for $2,000. He turns that house into a brewery. He knew a streetcar line would be built the next year. People were gonna be stopping by for beer on their way to the park. Uh, and then he needed to find a good English brewmaster because he needed English ale. And this was where we get to see John Dyke enter the scene. Uh, and uh, John Dyke's great-grandson is still in Vancouver. And I, I was able to look at some of their family records, which is really interesting. So Dyke was an accomplished brewer in England, but he could not make a career of it. His daughter, Kathleen, recalls as much. She said, my father was a master brewer and was considered quite a good catch, but he possessed neither the personality nor the ability to hold a position or run a business, and he failed in one venture after another. He took his family from town to town in search of a livelihood, so that the 10 children born to the family were nearly all born in different towns. Um, so when Dyke immigrated to Canada, he still struggled to find work as a brewer because he was trained in English style brewing and apparently this is just wasn't working well in Canada. Kathleen's account continues. There seemed to be no opening for him in his trade as a brewer for his favorite beer of the country, Canada, was lager. And he had no knowledge of brewing of that type. In fact, he had an extreme disdain for it. He's just like, I'm not gonna learn how to make lager. I'm a home brewer. I'm like, I, I can't do it. I'm just going to do ale. <laughs> um, so I hear you, John Dyke. So it seems that this, this sort of popularity of ale in Victoria didn't really translate to Vancouver or the rest of the country. This ended up working in his favor, though, when Frank Fubert met him and he wanted to brew English ale. So Fubert began a rigorous advertising campaign. He found a doctor who apparently wrote about Stanley Park Ale in a medical journal. He cited a tax assessor's official test of the beer's qualities and compared them to other beers. Um, Fubert's ads are really funny. <laughs> like he's, he, anyway, I, I can't even, I don't even have time to get into it, but he's, uh, he was very creative in his ads. Uh, so in doing this and sort of creating, um, uh, making an, uh, a market for English ale, he was really tapping into a powerful emotional current of the time, which is patriotism. So Vancouver obviously had a German community and an English community, but the province was still called British Columbia. And at this time, Around 1900, there's growing support of the city's British identity. And more of his uh, ads. <laughs> so to further appeal to these patriotic impulses, Fubert's brewery donated to various military-oriented events, including this really fascinating large-scale war reenactment for uh, the 1899 Dominion Day celebrations in Stanley Park. There were 10,000 onlookers, apparently. And Stanley Park Brewery was the focus of the final battles with one army protecting it and one army trying to capture it. 
the terms of surrender and so people like all the armies like the various branches of the army were coming from victoria like there was this is a big big thing the terms of surrender were conditional on stanley park brewery's cooperation and the papers tell us in the end the two armies mingled together and attested the splendid quality of Stanley Park Brewery and tested their capacities. It was a glorious and bloodless victory and the brewery is saved. I don't know what Fubert did to get his brewery at the center of that, but he knew, he knew people, he knew how to market his brewery. Um, that's another one of his, he's sort of comparing two different ads there. So by 1902, though, Foubert had to sell it. He, he was very, very ill. And uh, I don't have time to get into the complexities of what happened, but there was competition for who would have it. But ultimately, even when it was sold, uh, Stanley Park ended up being a kind of brand under Royal Brewing Company, and it just faded. It kind of dissolved. It kind of dissipated. Um, and by 1910, the city bought the land back and just tore down the brewery building. Um, and Frank Foubert's widow was able to get some of those profits. But... But yeah, sort of a, a sort of sad ending without Foubert at the at the head of the business. So while the Vancouver brewing industry is growing rapidly in the 1890s, Victoria industry was not quite as bustling. I mentioned some of those old guard breweries were struggling or closed in the 1880s and 90s. But by the early 1900s, a new brewery was rearing its head, and this one would become Victoria Phoenix's biggest rival, a rival rivalry that would contribute to more of those consolidations. And this was Silver Spring Brewery. Um, incorporated in 1902 or 1897, eh, again, by Robert Tate and his sons. At first, it was just a modest sort of two-story wooden building on William Street. Um, but in a few years, basically the father, Robert Tate, sold off his shares. And they basically allowed it to, the, the business closed and they reincorporated it under the same name, don't worry too much about it, but it's the same. They, they let Silver Spring close, then they reopened Silver Spring in 1908, and they relocated it and turned it into a different kind of brewery. And this was, uh, this would end up living in old Henry Farrell's brewery, the old ENN or Excelsior brewery. So they totally modernized it with the help of an American consultant. They standardized the equipment, like cleanliness is next to godliness is what they were all saying at the time. Um, knowing how to sanitize things. So it was like a new era in brewing. They had 100 employees and a wide distribution network that even extended to Mexico. Uh, so they really became the main competitor of what was also a modernized and expanded Victoria Phoenix Brewing. This new modernized Silver Spring put its first lager on the market. Oh, so you can see that even their labels look really similar, <laughs> Victoria Phoenix and Silver Spring. Um, so they put their lager on the market in 1910 for the first time, and this is exactly when, uh, according to papers, Charles During was trying to, quote, arrange a scheme for the amalgamation of the breweries on the BC coast. The object is to unite under one management all the breweries of Vancouver, New Westminster, Victoria, and Nanaimo. So again, reducing independent breweries. During's ambitions led to BC's first big beer merger, which is the formation of BC breweries in 1911 one year after Silver Spring was really up and running. They consolidated Durings Vancouver breweries, Beer Baron, and I haven't talked about Henry Rifle, but he's another big guy, Beer Baron, Henry Rifle's new Canadian Brewing and Malting, which was in Vancouver, Pilsner Brewing of Cumberland and Union Brewing of Nanaimo. And this basically gave a huge amount of money to uh, the big, uh, Rifle's big brewing plant at 11th and U in Vancouver, which is where both Rifles and Durings Breweries had sort of joined together to make all their popular local beers, which were Heidelberg, Cascade, UBC Bohemian, and BC Export. And through various changes and complexities, what began as BC Breweries would eventually become Carling O'Keefe, and Carling O'Keefe would eventually be acquired by a Molson Coors. Ten years later, um, another major corporate brewing consolidation occurred, which I mentioned earlier. This is Coast Breweries. Now we have joined together Victoria Phoenix, Silver Spring, Rainier Brewing, and Westminster Brewery. And like we said, it was purchased by Labatt in 1957. And of course, Labatt was acquired by Budweiser in 2008. So it doesn't seem like a very joyous ending for this crowd of early and independently owned, often really family operated pioneering breweries. All roads seem to lead either to closure or to big beer. But that was before a new group of BC business owners and brewers in the 80s and 90s entered the scene. And these are people like John Mitchell, Frank Appleton, Mitch Taylor, Tim Wittig, Shirley Warren, Ian Hill, 
Paul Hadfield, Bill Herdman, Gary Lowen, many others. And these folks decided there was really something of value in independent brewing and that big beer wasn't all it was cracked up to be despite all the optimism of the 1910s about what mergers would do for the industry. So the craft beer revolution began and it really still hasn't stopped. So thank you very much. Thank you.